Good morning and thank you for joining us this Lord's Day morning. We appreciate so much you taking the time to be with us for our program today and we invite you to come and worship with us at the Pyburn Street Church of Christ. We will meet this morning for Bible study at 9 o'clock followed by a period of worship to our God at 9.50 and then we will come together again this evening at 6 for another period of worship and we gather again on Wednesday nights at 7 for Bible study. You're always encouraged and invited to worship with us any time that you may have the opportunity to do so. A warm welcome is always extended unto you, and you will be our honored guest at Pyburn Street Church of Christ. This morning we are continuing our study of New Testament conversions, which are recorded in the book of Acts. The case of conversion that we're going to be examining this morning comes to us from Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 13, and it is the conversion of the Samaritans. In this account, Luke records for us that Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame, were healed. And there was a great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to them, or and to him, they had regard because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things that concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wandered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. The evangelist Philip, whose work is discussed here, is not Philip the Apostle. But this Philip is one of the seven evangelists that we read about in Acts chapter 6. After being driven from Jerusalem by persecution, this dedicated preacher of the gospel went down to Samaria. But he did not leave his religion back in Jerusalem. He took it to Samaria with him. And even though the Jewish Sanhedrin council greatly promoted the persecution of Christians, these dedicated men of God were glad to be able to share the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. Philip found a ripe harvest awaiting him in Samaria. And during the ministry of Jesus, he spent some time in Samaria laying the foundation of the faith. Philip now steps in and builds upon that foundation. But Philip was met with opposition in the form of deceptive sorcery. However, we find in this instance, sorcery did not try to oppose the truth, but tried to run parallel with it. Yet this false practice was a hindrance to Philip's ministry. Here we are introduced to a man commonly referred to as Simon the Sorcerer. Simon had found the people of Samaria to be very gullible, and he used this to deceive them into following after his wicked ways. And deliberately he caused them to think that he was the great one from God. So how did Philip combat this false teaching? Well, he was able to come along and prove with miracles and by preaching the truth that he was the one that was using the power of God. Only through these means could Philip prove that he was from God and Simon was an imposter. Philip performed miracles to confirm the proclaimed word of God, which was the purpose of miracles, just as Jesus explained to us in Mark 16 and verse 20. The Samaritans could not deny Philip's message when they saw it confirmed in such miraculous ways. In his preaching, Philip preached only the gospel of Christ, his life, 
his death, burial, and resurrection, his ascension into heaven, his church, and the commands of God regarding salvation and entrance into the kingdom. This was and is the basis of all scriptural truth, and it must be preached. No one can preach Christ today and leave out these essential aspects. Well, as a result of Philip's preaching, it is recorded that the people believed, and Simon himself also believed. They heard Philip's message and they accepted what he said as the truth. The Bible declares in Romans 10 and verse 17 that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The Samaritans not only believed in Jesus as the Christ, but they obeyed the Lord's command. Philip was not a faith-only preacher. He preached Jesus Christ and him crucified. He preached the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And when they heard the things concerning the kingdom of God, notice what the scriptures say. It says they were baptized, both men and women. This passage goes on to tell us that Simon, the former sorcerer, was also baptized. Simon believed he had faith in Jesus, he was baptized, therefore he was indeed saved at this point. But his faithfulness was very short-lived. His greed caused him to quickly re-enter his old way of life, and he was found in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Simon was a man who had heart trouble. He was told, Thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thoughts of thine heart be forgiven thee. So in order for Simon to return to God's favor, he had to repent and to pray. Friends, we need to thank God each and every day for this wonderful blessing. His willingness to pardon the sins of erring Christians when they repent and pray for forgiveness. And here is the conclusion that we must come to with Simon. He was a child of God, but he fell away and so much so that he was in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Obviously he had lost that saved condition. And in order to obtain forgiveness, he had to repent and to pray that God would forgive him. And friends, this proves without a doubt that a child of God can fall from grace. They can fall away and be lost. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand, take heed lest he fall. In Samaria, the gospel of Christ was preached. The people heard it. They believed it. They obeyed the word of God and they were converted to Christ. And this is our example for today. This is how one becomes a child of God, even to this very day. Friends, many people today confuse God's promises with God's commands. Christ Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit after his return to the Father in heaven. The purpose of the promised gift was to guide the apostles into all truth. The truth, the gospel, God's power to save, was to convert men to Christ. And the gospel consisted of commands to be obeyed. The Spirit revealed the gospel. That was God's promise. But commandments are to be obeyed, and promises are to be fulfilled. Also, we must not confuse conditions of conversion with circumstances of conversion. For example, on the day of Pentecost, when over 3,000 souls were converted, the Holy Spirit suddenly came from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, Acts chapter 2 and verse 2. Those were circumstances that were peculiar to this occasion. This was not part of the conditions of conversion for those 3,000 souls. That condition was plain. Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. But so often people want to try to turn circumstances into conditions. And they say that those circumstances must take place before conversion actually happens. And so they say that the Holy Spirit must move, that there must be a miraculous moving of the Spirit before conversion has really taken place. But conditions and circumstances have no particular relationship with each other. One is essential, 
one is not. For example, when the jailer and his household were converted in Acts chapter 16, there was a great earthquake. But that was not a condition of conversion. It was merely a circumstance of the occasion. But the conditions of salvation for the jailer were the same as everyone else, as we will see in a future study. Probably each one of us have had various circumstances arise that were particular to our occasion of conversion, from things such as cold water to broken baptistries to the water being too deep, the preacher falling in, having to chop ice to make a hole, fighting off snakes. These are all just circumstances, experiences that I've either witnessed myself or that I've read about. But these howbeit memorable circumstances, had no bearing upon the conditions of conversion. Philip preached that they were to believe and be baptized, and that's what they did. But some may ask, did not the Samaritans receive the miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit? Yes, but this was a special imparting that had to come from the laying on of the apostles' hands. And although Philip was a minister of the gospel, although he was able to perform miracles, he could not pass this gift on to others. The apostles, when they heard the great results that were taking place in Samaria, they came down from Jerusalem and they laid hands upon them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. And this was something that was necessary for only the apostles had the ability to perform this task. But also we need to point out that Simon was told that he had neither part nor lot in the matter when he sinned by trying to purchase the gift of conferring the Spirit. The Samaritans in general, like Christians today, received the Spirit through the Word of God when they obeyed the Gospel. The miraculous gifts, though, came through the laying on of apostles' hands, Therefore, when the last apostle, that being the apostle John, when he passed away, the conferring of miraculous gifts passed away along with him. When the people of Samaria were converted, they were begotten by the Holy Spirit through the word of God and born of water into the kingdom of Christ, just like those 3,000 souls on the day of Pentecost. We read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 23, a wonderful statement that is very pertinent to our study today. For in this passage, the Apostle Peter records for us, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Friends, regenerating life is found within the seed. The regenerating power of the Spirit is inseparable from the gospel of Jesus Christ, the truth, the word, the seed of the kingdom. The Samaritans were converted to the Lord. They were born again citizens of the kingdom of Christ, members of the Lord's church. They were not converted by a direct operation of the Holy Spirit. Without exception, the gospel of Christ, the word, is the power to save the believer. There is no record in the Bible of any person being converted to Christ by direct operation of the Spirit but like those in our account today, each and every one of us must repent of our sins. We must turn away from the things of this life and set our sights on things above. And we must be baptized into Christ. For it is by being buried in the waters of baptism that we come into contact with the saving blood of Jesus Christ. And we're told that when we are raised up out of those waters, we are raised a new person. We have taken on a spiritual identity, having been made alive by the Spirit. This morning, I encourage you to consider these things in light of your own conversion. Consider these things to see 
if you're in the Lord. May God bless you with a wonderful Lord's Day.